Hello, my name is Michael Whitehouse and I'm the writer and showrunner of Fear Noir. Before we begin our first ever episode, I wanted to give special mention to David, Olivia and all the team at the No Sleep podcast. Throughout the years they have been incredibly supportive of my writing and other works and without that support, Fear Noir wouldn't even exist. So if you're looking for some of the best audio horror in existence, search for the No Sleep podcast on your app of choice and support them the way they have supported so many horror creators and listeners in the community throughout the years. I'd also like to thank Peter Joseph Lewis, Gemma Amore, Alan Graham, Martin Yates and Callum McPhail for helping bring the show and promotional materials to life with their immeasurable talent. That's all from me for now, but stay tuned for an announcement at the end of this episode. Enjoy the show. Settles down, we are lost with no lights on to the place where we drown beneath the horizon. Forewarned, you are in fear, noir. I work in the city of Night's Fall as a private detective. The mix of bad luck and strange vagaries that led me into my profession are too numerous to mention. Suffice to say, I... I do not enjoy what I do. Working the streets of Night's Fall is a dangerous game. There's something about this city. The smell of it. The dirt. It's only when the rain comes and blankets the grey sidewalks and anonymous city blocks that there's any kind of relief from the stench. It's a... Monday afternoon. I still have a hangover. It's lucky that I slept in my office for once last night. A few days ago, I woke up on a park bench after a bad night on white rum, shivering from near hypothermia. My office is on the east side of the city. It's sandwiched between a derelict apartment building on one side and a run-down hotel on the other that everyone knows is a brothel, even the cops. They ignore it, like everything else around here. The rest of my building is empty, all six stories. Anyone who can afford it has left for a better place. I, it's safe to say, cannot afford to leave. (laughs) I can barely afford the office I have, rats and all. Last month, I was evicted from my apartment. Living here is probably breaking my lease agreement, but no one in their right mind would come up here to check. I'm sitting at my desk, the files on top of it piled up in haphazard fashion. Organization has never been my strong point. The rest of the office is bare, except for a red couch. I bought that when things were better financially. (sighs) I've been hitting the booze too hard lately. I know this. My head is pounding from the previous night's session at Diamond Girls. It's a strip joint. I do not go there for the women. I go there because I did a favor for the owner once. She lets me drink at half price. Speaking of drinking, I feel I need to drink some water. 
I get up from behind my desk and fill a glass at the sink in the bathroom. I'm not sure if the water is safe to drink, but I drink it anyway. My reflection in the mirror does my sense of self-worth a little good. I'm 39 years old. In a few months, it's the big 4-0. Looking in the mirror, I see the dark patches under my eyes. I see the grim expression beneath the stubble on my face. My brown hair has receded slightly, and I know I'm finally entering that strange twilight between being young and old. Footsteps sound in the corridor outside my office. Quickly splashing water on my face, I rush back to my desk and open the top drawer. Next to a bottle of Lagavulin scotch is a black tie. The footsteps are getting closer. They've reached the door. I quickly put the tie around my collar and make the best knot I can. Two loud knocks come at the door. Come in, <clears throat> I say, clearing my throat and trying to sound at least half together. The door opens and in steps a man in his late fifties. He has a small black mustache, glasses, and slicked back receding hair. There is not much to him. The suit he's wearing hangs off his body. Maybe he's ill. Mr. Allison, the man says with a nasally voice. I nod and stand up. My head is throbbing, but I plaster a false grin across my face as I shake his hand. His grip is weak. His palm is clammy. After a few unnecessary pleasantries, the man introduces himself as Arthur Hales. Nelly recommended you. He says, I search my fogged mind and I slowly remember a case I worked on the previous summer involving someone with that name. Ah, did she divorce her husband? I ask. Arthur shakes his head. No, he says, but she made him pay for his infidelity. And it's infidelity that Arthur has come to me about. My wife, he says. She is meeting someone at night and I want to know who it is. Arthur produces an envelope from his inside pocket and lays it on my desk. It's the type of envelope I like, thick and heavy. I pick it up and see at least a grand inside. I'll need her name and some more details, I say, still counting the cash. Indeed, says Arthur, handing me a photograph of his wife. My wife's name is Melody, he says. I've followed her the last few evenings, but I think she is on to me. Why? I ask. Because Arthur leans forward in his chair. She knows I am a man of religious conviction. I will not enter a graveyard at night. After further discussion, I get all of the information I need. It seems Melody Hales is meeting someone each night at Craven's Cemetery. A strange place to have an affair, but this city's full of twisted kinks. Arthur explains to me that because there is a church on the grounds, he will not enter after dusk. It's a custom I don't rightly understand. He's a member of some strict religious group, but I don't ask for more details. I don't need them. This is a simple case of find out who's banging your wife. I've run cases like this for 15 years. It's usually the best friend. Arthur leaves, seemingly satisfied he's hired someone good enough for the job, and telling me that there will be a much larger bonus if I get a picture of the guy his wife is meeting. I grab my bag and pack a few things for the stakeout. Then I sleep. Twilight comes quick, and when it does, I leave my office, get in my old dark blue Corvette and hit the streets. I feel the purr of the engine as I drive out to the south side. Something's wrong with the transmission. I can hear it, but I can't do anything about it without money. The 1980 Corvette is as old as I am, but it's about the only thing that's ever been good to me in this life. It was the last model Corvette they made without using computer chips. That suits me just fine. 
We are both from another age, and I don't trust technology. Rain has given the city a sheen. It's easy to forget the grime and filth in these moments, but the funk of the city is still there beneath it. Oily residues flushing along the concrete into clogged drains, and drunks passed out with their mouths open. The street lights hurt my eyes as they reflect on random pools of water. The hangover is gone, but my recent habits have taken their toll on my mood. I take a left on Hamill Street, and the cemetery comes into view. It rises up a rolling hillside. Its permanent residents are under the soil if they're poor, in tombs if they're rich. It doesn't matter. They all end up in the same place, as far as I'm concerned. The large black iron gates out front are closed. I get out of my car and quickly investigate. The gates are secured with a chain and padlock. I'm interested to see how Melody Hales will get past them. I return to my car and park on the opposite side of the street, under the shadow of a large sycamore tree. Only amateurs park under street lights. The smallest shard of light can give away the fact that you're laying low in your car and watching. Being close but unseen is part of the gig. Reclining my chair slightly, I sit in the darkness. Now it's just a waiting game. And so I wait, and I wait. The sun is now well and truly gone, replaced by a thick blanket of darkness. My watch says it's nearly midnight. I should be drunk in a bar somewhere right now. But my bank account is nearly empty, and I need the money. I'm looking at the gates when I see a shadow moving on the other side of the street. Walking along the sidewalk, wearing a long dark blue coat and high heels, is a woman. Her brown hair is up, and her red lipstick gleams every time she walks under the spot of a street light. I look down at the photograph Arthur gave me. And that's her. I grumble under my breath. I wait to see what she'll do next, snap a few shots on my camera. She stops at the gates and looks around. For a second, I'm sure she looks straight at me, but I don't move. Melody then turns to the gates. I expect she'll be disappointed that she can't get inside. Wait, that's impossible. The chain and padlock just slipped off the gate rail by themselves. They dropped to the floor. Melody doesn't seem surprised by this, but I am. She walks inside. Something isn't right about this. And when you work as long as I have as a private investigator, you learn to usually listen to your gut. I don't want to follow. I feel that if I do, I'm going to see something I shouldn't. But my gut doesn't pay the bills, so... If Melody is having an affair, despite the bizarre location, I have to get a photo of the man she's meeting. I wait for a moment, then I step out of the car. The night air is cool, but not too cold, yet I, I feel a shiver run up my back as I approach the gate. Sure enough, the padlock and chain are on the ground. Bizarrely, the padlock is not unlocked. None of this makes sense. I check my Smith & Wesson 442. It's snug in my shoulder holster. Some investigators don't carry, but they are usually dealing with harmless insurance scams. I have to carry because I seem to attract those of a... Um, an unstable disposition. I slip between the metal gates. The cemetery isn't well lit. There are a few street lights dotted around here and there on the paths that weave up the hill. I listen carefully. Ah, there it is. The unmistakable sound of a woman's heels on gravel. I follow the path to the right, but stay off it to remain out of sight. Sticking to the grass to make as little sound as possible, I realize I'm walking over grave after grave. They won't mind. The dead don't complain. Not like the living. 
I move fast, but I struggle to keep up with the sound of Melody's heels. I can't see her. The path seems darker than it did before. Ahead, it coils like a snake further up the hill. Melody is unbelievably fast, but that makes no sense. The sound of her footsteps are slow and methodical, and yet they grow quieter as they move off into the distance. I can't hear them now. The same shiver I felt at the cemetery gates runs up my spine again. I touch my revolver in its holster. It's as though I'm afraid I'll be dead if I lose it. There is a, a strange nausea now, a sickness bubbling away in the pit of my stomach. The alcohol, it's, it's just the alcohol, I whisper to myself. Too many late nights, too much booze, not enough food and sunlight. I have to push on. The graves around me cast shadows from the streetlight. As I run past them silently, they feel larger than before, more present in my mind. It's as though they are watching me. I shake the feeling as best I can. Moving up the hill, I can hear something, a mix of scratching and wetness. Peering over a large headstone, I... I see the source of the noise. It's Melody. I cannot believe my eyes. She's... She's kneeling by a fresh grave. They must have buried someone there earlier in the day, and she is undoing the grave digger's handiwork. I watch, hypnotized. A strange feeling comes over me, like I'm no longer an active participant in the world. I'm merely watching something truly uncanny through warped glass. I don't know how long I've been here, but now the haze is starting to lift. I can hear something else. The sound of snapping and teeth on bone. I look on in disbelief at Melody, her red lipstick now smeared across her cheek. Her arms are covered in wet soil and her hands. She, she's holding something. My god, it's the head of a corpse. She's biting into its face like an apple. I can hear the sucking of juices. I know implicitly that she's consuming the eyeballs and their fluids inside. A surge of disgust wells up inside of me. It's the first time something has shocked me for years. I pull out my gun, I point it in the air and squeeze the trigger. The sound of the shot echoes across the cemetery. Melody looks up. Wet fluids dribble from her mouth as she drops the head she removed from the grave. She lets out a strange guttural sound and then screams. That scream shakes my insides and pierces my hearing. I drop to my knees and instinctively cover my ears with my hands. The pain is agonizing. When the screaming stops, I stagger to my feet, revolver still in hand. Melody is running through the gravestones now. I give chase and see her stop at a large rectangular tomb. It looks old, the white stone weathered and darkened with the grime of the city. As I approach, something stops me dead in my tracks. The tomb door is open, and from the darkness I see two pinpoints of light staring out at me. Melody beside me looks at me with disgust in her face and then rushes towards the tomb door. The sound of stone grating against stone rings out and the tomb seals with a bang before she can get inside. She begins to sob uncontrollably, smashing her fists against the stone door. I've seen this before. It is the hopelessness of addiction. She then collapses on the ground. I approach the gun in my hand, trembling slightly. I lean down over Melody and check her pulse. She's out cold, but alive. I don't want to spend another second near that tomb. Whatever was staring at me, it isn't human. I pick up Melody's motionless body and I put her over my shoulder. 
I'm not as fit as I once was, but adrenaline pushes me on. As fast as I can, I carry Melody away further down the hill. I then hear a chilling sound from inside the tomb. Something lets out a low, evil laugh. I don't look back. As soon as I get Melody back to my car, I drop her in the passenger seat and speed across town to Knightsfall General Hospital. Grudgingly, as the doctors attend to Melody, she is in a delirious state, shifting in and out of consciousness. When she is awake, she snarls like an animal and is desperate to escape her bed. She has to be restrained. The doctors seem confused by her condition. But I know, at least I think I do, that thing in the tomb has a power over her. Arthur Hales has finally arrived. It's only taken him two hours since I called. I'm unimpressed. He doesn't seem concerned by what's happened to his wife. He seems more interested in my story about the tomb and its occupant. After a discussion with a doctor, Melody is sedated and taken to a psychiatric ward. I don't know what will happen to her. Arthur walks into the hospital corridor outside the ward with me. The fluorescent lights hurt my eyes, and the smell of the place. The disinfectant reminds me only of when my dad bought the big one in a cancer ward. I tell Arthur what happened at the cemetery in greater detail, regardless of what he might think of my story. He is unsurprised. You knew, didn't you, you son of a bitch? I yell in the hallway. Arthur nods. The tomb belongs to a competitor of my grandfather's. The story is my grandfather took everything from him, and he swore revenge. Seems he's trying to get at me by doing something to my wife. The joke's on him. I don't care much for Melody at all these days. I say to him, she's still your wife. Oh, not for long. <laughs> <laughs> he laughs as he says this and continues. You are the third private investigator I've hired to go up there, and the only one to make it out. I don't appreciate being a lab rat. I turn to walk away. I've had enough. Mr. Ellison, Arthur says. He pulls out an even larger envelope than the first. There's five grand in here if you'll go up there and destroy the tomb. I won't step foot up there. Let me ask you a question, I say. Do you want me to destroy the tomb for your sake or your wife's? Mine, of course, he replies. And so, what the hell? I punch him square in the face. <clears throat> at least he's in the hospital to get his broken nose looked at. I keep walking. I don't do business with anyone who thinks I'm expendable. I don't have much self-worth, but I at least value my life. I head to Diamond Girl's strip joint and curl up at the bar until morning, but something keeps eating away at my mind. I can't get drunk in peace. God help me if I'm developing a conscience. But it's like... This pair of accusatory eyes staring up at me from the bottom of my glass. See, Melody, that poor girl has something terribly wrong with her. I keep thinking about what happened in the cemetery. About what 
kind of unspeakable thing could reduce someone to digging up body parts and eating the dead. And when she tried to run into the tomb like she was going to the embrace of her lover, like whatever's in that tomb has power over her. I'm not superstitious, but I've read enough bad horror novels that I can't let this stand. In a moment of drunken stupidity, I leave Diamond Girl's strip joint and head to the nearest gas station in the blistering sunshine. I give some sob story to the woman working there about my car running out of gas, and she sells me a one-gallon gas can for my troubles. I fill it up, and I get a cab over to the south side. There, I head back into the cemetery and to that old stone tomb. I can see there's a narrow slit in the side wall so loved ones can look inside the tomb. It's dark in there. I can barely see what's on the floor. I pour the entire canister through the slit. The smell of gas stings my eyes. Nothing moves in there. I'm, I'm unsure if this will even work, but what the hell? I throw a match in anyway. A loud whoosh sounds and I duck for cover. Flames and black smoke pour out of the small slit on the wall. When the fire lessens, I look inside. Something has changed. In the dim embers, the interior is now illuminated. There's a body on the floor, and it's moving. Its hands stretch out, searching for an escape. I watch as it writhes in pain until it stops. The fire has drawn the attention of the cemetery caretaker. i better split. I walk away from the tomb, and... This time, I'm the one that's laughing. Settles down, we are lost with no lights on to the place where we drown beneath the horizon. Forewarned, you are in fear. Noir. Fear Noir is written and produced by Michael Whitehouse, starring Peter Joseph Lewis, with Gemma Amore singing the theme to the show. Alan Graham also provided the artwork. Links to their websites and social media can be found in the show notes. Fear Noir is one of several Ghastly Tales productions and is made possible by our amazing patrons. So a big thank you to Charlie, Ouga, Mimi, Rudy, Caroline, that's my mother folks, Leanne, Alexandra, Aaron, Blue Doggy, Kathy, Jim, Lauren, Mr. Creepy Pasta, John, Annie Nimous, Rentang, Miriam, John C, Geraldine, Quill and Scale Designs, Stephen, Tim, Jennifer, Original Stephen, Don, Esther, Dana, and David. If you would like to join the Ghastly Tales Patreon page and receive exclusive podcasts, stories and other content, head over to patreon.com forward slash Michael Whitehouse. You'll also find other exclusive content on the Ghastly Tales YouTube channel. Links are in the description below. Thanks again and we'll see you soon for the next episode of Fear Noir.